Hello, folks. DragonKeeper19600 here. Well, it's been two weeks since the Invader Zim movie Enter the Florpus made its grand debut on Netflix, and I gotta say, it is a great time to be an Invader Zim fan. The movie has brought in an influx of new fans who are interested in Invader Zim content and are disappointed by the apparent dearth thereof. Now, I want to give a special thanks to the people who managed to catch my reaction to the Invader Zim movie before during the week that was up on YouTube before it was inevitably removed. I got a lot of love and comments from those of you who watched, and thank you so much to the over 100,000 of you who tuned in. And um, for the small number of people who gave me hate and are po pointing and laughing at me that the video was inevitably removed, I now have over 2,000 subscribers thanks to that video, so nah! <laughs> but I didn't come here to be petty. I came here because I got a comment from one user who asked me, because I repeatedly referenced the comics throughout the movie, pointing out plot points and such that were ripped from them, and this one person asked me, what do you mean by comics? What do I mean by comics? Do you... Oh. <laughs> I realized that I have a rare opportunity to actually introduce the Invader Zim comic to you. Yes, for those of you who didn't know, Oni Press has been releasing an official comic adaptation of the Invader Zim series starting in 2015, with issues coming out on basically a monthly basis. And, as I'm about to show you, I own 40 issues, and the remaining six will be here as soon as I get my package in the mail. Now, a few things you need to know about these comics. One, yes, they are official and they are canon. Joan and Vasquez even wrote a few of them, and though... A lot of issues, he's actually taken a backseat as a sort of creative control guy, since most of his focus has been on his other projects, plus the Ender the Florpus movie. A lot of other alum from Invader Zim have more active roles. Eric Trueheart, a major writer on the show who wrote episodes like Bad Bad Rubber Piggy, has written several of my favorite issues. And um, we've got Aaron Alexevich writing a few issues and doing pencil work. We've got Ricky Simons back as the colorist. And the first issue even is kind enough to credit the voice actors, even though, of course, they're not appearing in the comic. Because it's a comic. Now, years ago on my channel, I actually did a review of the first two issues, which I thought, hey, some... It's a great time to be an Invader Zim fan. People are starved for Invader Zim content. Why don't I highlight the comic on my channel? I mean, these comics sell pretty well. Like, I actually went um, this past week to, the, to Golden Apple, which is my favorite comic book store on Melrose Avenue here in L.A., and I was looking for Invader Zim comics, and the only one they had was this single issue. And I don't mean they only had copies of my, this of this particular issue. I mean that this physical copy was the only one they had. And when I asked the guy at the store about it, he's like, oh yeah, um, you know, those sell pretty fast. Like, we don't stock very many of them, but whenever we have them, people just snap them up. So these comics are popular, but I feel like they could be more popular. <laughs> and so I'm going to use my new platform with my new subscribers, who I know are all interested in Zim stuff, to talk about these comics in a more detailed way, like I should have been doing for years now, but haven't been because life gets in the way sometimes. Now, there are a few things I want to say about the comic before I go into it. First of all, the art style is, as I think is typical for a lot of um, comic series, though I'm not a huge Western comics person, so I don't know. Uh, the art style between issues is very different. So uh, a lot of people say that the um, art style in the end of the Flippers movie is more similar to the comics. That's Kinda true. The color palette in Enter the Florpus is more similar to the comics, where it uses brighter, more saturated colors as opposed to the dark and dirty look of the actual show. However, the art style actually changes issue per issue, depending on the artist. Sometimes the comic will bring in guest artists who do a wildly different uh, art style, going into sort of like an almost like newspaper strip kind of wacky look, and I know Joan and Vasquez fans have a particular relationship with the word wacky, but I really couldn't come up with a better um, word. <laughs> Second of all, the issues are mostly focused on standalone stories. This isn't like a big serialized thing. Um, there was an interview with Eric Trueheart, one of the main writers of the show and comic that I mentioned already, where he explained that they're not really going to go into Invader Zim lore very deeply, at least at first. And it's been four years, so I guess at first kind of turned into like a long-term strat. That said, there are several issues that are part of um, ongoing arcs, but usually those only last between two to four issues, and they'll be, like, marketed as, like, part one of the such-and-such such arc. Um, one of these arcs, if I can just find the issue real quick, it's a lot of comics to go through, actually goes more in detail onto Moopink 10. 
the um, prison that was featured in Enter the Floor Pit. So there were two issues focused to the prison, which made it a little surprising in the movie when they just went quickly in and out. But if you want to know more about that prison and see Zim locked up there like he deserves to be, then you could check out, let's see, what is this? Issues 34 and 35 of the comic, which will give you more detail on that. Um, several other details from the movie are mostly taken from the first two issues, which I already reviewed. And if you're curious about what Zim's original phase two was and Enter the Floorpus before he forgot it, that is covered in issue two, which I already reviewed on this channel. So I don't think Oni Press is selling the first few issues of the comic. I think that if you want to get the first few issues, you have to buy the volumes or buy the issues used. So the volumes are usually contain five issues and are released only after a certain number of issues along the series are released. So this is volume four and it contains issues 21 through 25, I think. If I'm doing the math right, maybe I'm not. Maybe it's 16 through 15. It's 16 through 20. I'm good at numbers, guys. I majored in cinema. What do you want from me? But anyway, so a lot of... One more thing I want to say about the comics is that a lot of uh, the big, like, characters that seem like they were beginning major arcs in the show have yet to appear, which is a little frustrating for some fans. So if you want to see the ongoing adventures of Tack or Scooge or the Resistee, you're going to be a little disappointed because none of those characters have appeared so far. Um, however, we did have the return of Bill. Because when you're thinking of Invader Zim characters that deserve to return to the comics, you, of course, think of fucking Bill. They're filed wrong. You've got Bigfoot and dinosaurs in with the fake stuff. You think those things are real? That's exactly what they want you to believe. That's what who wants me to believe. So now that you've gotten, like, kind of a picture of what these comics are trying to do and what they look like, let's look at a particular favorite issue of mine, issue four. Now, um, I haven't reviewed issue three in my channel, and I'm decided to skip it to talk about issue four. Uh, not because issue three is a bad issue. I think it's pretty good. It's funny. It's creative. The art looks good. And a lot of the jokes land. It's also the debut of Zim's infamous hipster look, which uh, was circulating on Tumblr for a while and might still be because, you know, if you throw glasses and a hat on somebody, people on Tumblr just lose their shit. But I wanted to talk about issue four because like I said, it's one of my favorite issues and it's the one that ties in it's one that's early on, and it's one that ties in pretty closely to some of the themes between Dib and Zim's characters in uh, Ender the Florpus, especially Zim. Now, if you guys have been uh, following my Tumblr, or even if you hadn't, you might have noticed um, what the movie did for Zim's character, which is that it brought out the parallel between him and Dib, both being uh, basically attention-starved outcasts who really, really want approval from an important authority figure in their life. For Dib, it's Professor Membrane, and for Zim, it's the tallest. So this issue really examines, not really examines, but paints a snapshot of the type, of basically the main conflict that drives Zim throughout this, the franchise, and especially in the movie, of Zim desperately trying to prove himself to the tallest. Um, this isn't the first issue to feature the tallest, but it is the first one where they play a major role. And it's um, it's not only funny, but it's kind of tragic in an illuminating way, just how far Zim is willing to go to please these two assholes who actually don't like him, but he's like incapable of accepting that. It's like a really, really nuanced situation. But anyway, so this particular issue was written by Eric Trueheart, though it says that Jonan did do some of the dialogue. The art in the issue was done by Aaron Alexevich, who worked as a character designer, among other things in the original show. So the art style in this particular issue is pretty close to the show. Um, it has a lot of the same type of expressions that the show use, and the characters have the same basic models. There's an artist that'll come in for later issues named Maddie C, who um, does like this kind of more cartoonish like stretch and squash kind of um, art for the characters, which I think looks really good, but we'll talk about her when we get to her. But this for the most part keeps it on model with the show. And um, the basic premise of this issue is that the Tallis basically are dicking around with this teleporter thing that the scientists invented uh, that allows them to teleport anything they wish to any invader they wish. So, being the dick jackasses that they are, <laughs> tallest, the tallest decide to use it to teleport 
a piece of garbage that they don't want to throw in the trash can because the trash can's too far away to a random invader's place, and of course it ends up at Zim's. Now, when Zim receives this piece of garbage, which is actually just like a giant cheesy, like they call it a mini mega munchatronic cheese thing. And it's like, it's, it looks like one of those puffy Cheetos, but it's like this big. <laughs> when Zim receives it, he thinks it's some kind of, he doesn't know what it is, but he knows that the tall send it to him. And he actually calls them in like a callback to the Mega Doom episode where he's talking really fast. Oh, thank you. You've done the right thing, my Tosh, and you won't be forgotten when I rule the universe. Thanks, this amazing Mega Mech. Bye. So Zim is excited to receive a thing with the tallest. And the tallest, knowing that it's garbage, decide to have a little fun with Zim. So they basically just tell him that it's a weapon that he needs to recharge by doing basically whatever ridiculous thing that they come up with, which includes smacking it into the faces of old people at the park, getting intentionally hit by a plane while carrying it, and, sum and submerging himself into a vat of boiling tuna. Now, as hilarious as that is, the really hilarious part is actually in the second half of the comic where the Tullus run out of ridiculous things for Zim to do. So they basically come up with an idea where they don't have to keep calling him every five minutes, which is they pretend to be under the, they pretend to be under attack, like shaking the camera and such like this and tell Zim that he needs to hide the weapon at all costs. And this part is where we truly see Zim's paranoia sort of tear him apart as he basically goes into like red scare levels of paranoia mode out of absolutely no threat whatsoever. Though, though the first half of the issue was funny, the second half is where it gets really funny and also kind of tragic, but in a hilarious way, as we see Zim's repeated attempts to keep his base safe only end up stressing him out more. There's one particularly hilarious bit I love where he tells his uh, garden gnomes, remember the gnomes that are outside um, doing security to shoot, to go on high alert mode and shoot at everything that moves. So they all shift to go into like, they like move to go into like super defense mode and they all end up shooting each other. And Zim hears the fire outside and assumes that, assumes that he's under attack. So that drives him even deeper into paranoia. And it's just that note over and over as Zim just fucking like is just confronted over and over by just nothing. Um, and it really highlights what I love about Zim's character is that he just, he can't chill and his priorities are entirely wrong. He's so troubled by his own mind. Now, every writer has a style and every individual writer on Invader Zim has a different priority or set of expectations or a different sensibility that goes into when writing episodes. Now, Eric Trueheart's thing when he was on the show was he was for high concept ideas. So a lot of world building or big sci-fi things were Eric's episodes. Whereas other writers such as Danielle Koenig focused on more down earth emotion driven stories. Um, Danielle was the one who wrote the unaired Mopiness of Doom episode and also the one who wrote uh, the Vindicated episode where Dib seems to find an ally in Mr. Dwicky. So different writers will bring different things to the table. Eric, like I said, is a sci-fi world builder guy and we do see a bit of cool stuff on the massive from him. For example, the scientist who invents the teleporter that the Tallis uses named Scranton and he uh wears a backpack full of severed Vortian brains with a tube attached to his head that apparently makes him intelligent enough to design this thing. Now, for those of you who are new Invaders and fans, you might not know about the Vortians, which weren't brought up really in Enter the Florpus. The Vortians are an alien race of goat people who were actually allied with the Urkin Empire before they were conquered by Invader Larb. Um, their planets were actually... Their planet was actually one of the first to fall, and we can actually track the progression of Invader Larb's conquest of Vort through the show. We see him get assigned to Vort in the first episode. We see him later sitting on the universe's most comfortable couch. Later, we hear that Vort has been conquered, and in that same episode, we also meet a re the Resisti, a group of rebels led by Vortians. Vortians, their lot is hard <laughs> in this series. And the idea that they're actually being killed and harvested for their organs is, uh, kind of grisly. I'm gonna die! Whose idea was this? 
The portrayal of the tallest is also interesting in several ways, and because it aligns itself more with how the movie portrays them than how a lot of fans have been portraying them for a long time. Um, there's a tendency in the fandom to portray Red as much more level-headed and intelligent as Purple. Now, to be fair, there is some canon basis for this. In the episode Backseat Drivers from Beyond the Stars, which was the same episode that brought in the Resisti, um, Red has was shown as being more competent and more capable of focusing that purple, and he actually fixed the major f- problem that was wrong with the massive in that episode. I have heard some criticism from people who say that Red was flanderized into being just as stupid as purple in uh, the movie. And while there is a definite drop in Red's competence between that episode and the movie, you have to remember... Red and purple are two halves of a whole idiot. And having red be super intelligent and competent kind of goes against the thematic sort of purpose of Invader Zim, which is that everyone is stupid and we will always be stupid, no matter how advanced or enlightened with otherworldly knowledge we become. You can't change human nature. And basically the Urkans are a reflection of us. Their their stupid leaders are meant to show that we aren't really going to change no matter how far we get. So Red's portrayal as just as immature as Purple is one that I feel like makes sense, even though it might be a little jarring for people who wanted Red to be a secret badass because uh, secret badassery is not really what Invader Zim is about. It comes up sometimes, but for the most part, this is about dumb people doing dumb things. Red is not significantly smarter than Purple in this particular issue. Purple is actually the one who comes up with the scheme to mess with Zim by getting him to torture himself in the name of the Empire, though Red quickly catches on. And there is a bit of a coloring error where it seems like they accidentally attribute Red to coming up with the plan, but then they act like it was Purple all along. That's what you get when you have two characters with the same model. Sometimes you color them wrong and things get confusing. There's also a bit where Red is struggling to come up with a name for the supposed weapon that, remember, is really just a jumbo chip, and he comes up with Munchatronic Death Scrang. Scrang being the name of the scientist that invented the teleporter, and he even, like, tries to protest, like, hey, my name is Scratch. So what I think is interesting about that is a lot of times fans, when enjoying a particular work, will try to craft what Henry Jenkins has described as a meta text, uh, basically meaning that they treat each installment of a series, no matter how standalone the installments are supposed to be, as part of an ongoing serial with characters that have all their traits consistent in between each portrayal. Now, in writer's land, that's really not true. Characters, motivations, and personality traits are changed depending on the writer, depending on what's needed for a particular story. But it is interesting that this one character trait of Red's seems to be consistent between the show and this comic, which is Red is kind of bad with words. <laughs> we see it in the first episode of the show where he forgets what the word Armada is. And we see it in this issue where he forgets what, where when he struggles to come up with a word, he names the... And, scientist who's standing right behind him. And we also see it again in the uh, Backstreet Drivers from Beyond the Stars where he talks about firing some kind of laser thingy at him. Like, for all his supposed technical, uh, tactical abilities, Red struggles with talky things (laughs) sometimes. And I do like that that trait is pretty consistent. There's another bit in the comic coming up where he'll struggle to remember Invader Larb's name. And, uh... I honestly, I can kind of relate. I'm not good with names either. (laughs) This is Invader Lorp or whatever. (laughs) So the idea that Purple actually has to correct him on those words, despite supposedly being the dumber one, is kind of a cool trait. Plus, I don't like that the tallest have just been flanderized into one's the smart and one's the dumb one. Like, no, they're both supposed to be immature jackasses. Like, let's not lose, uh, let's not lose the point of the thread here. Hey! I like snacks! He likes snacks, Sim. This issue also features some pretty creative dialogue, and I can see why it credited Jonah with adding dialogue, because some of this... Some of these lines are clearly very Jonah-esque. I mentioned in my reaction to uh, Enter the Florpus how the line... How, like, the banner of... With Gloinky's Blorf Day is uh, classic (laughs) Jonah humor, because, like, just having alien words be, like, really intentionally stupid-sounding... 
words and names are just kind of his thing. There's um, a few lines where Zim is rambling to himself in his paranoia where he mentions very strange things that Joan and Perler finds hilarious. And I find hilarious too, just because there's no context for them anyway. There's one I like where he hears, um, he sends Gurr to check in the vents for any other intrusions after finding a bird's nest in the vent and shooting it and a, and basically a frenzied neurotic display. And while <laughs> Gurr is in the vents, because as Mythbusters proved to us, climbing in vents makes a shit ton of noise. Zim uh, is cowering under a work table, and I'm going to quote his line word for word. That sound, the clunking, is it Gur, or is it an enemy made of clunks? A pure clunk being? What would such a creature be called? Clunculon? Can I take the risk that Clunculon hunts me even now? I have no proof, but I'm pretty sure Jonan wrote that. <laughs> that seems like a Jonan line. Go home and shave your giant head of smell with your bad self! kinds of things wrong with what you just said. The ending of this issue is really funny too. Zim basically tunnels himself deep into his base, first in a safeness room, then a safeness box, because the safeness room isn't safe enough. Then he digs a safeness hole, basically to the core of the earth with, I don't know if you can see the art here, but a small little rock on his head that reads safe. <laughs> so cute. Gimme. And he basically hides there and says he's going to wait there indefinitely until a girly ranger rings the doorbell. Now, if you remember from the show, girly rangers were basically the Girl Scout XBs. This girl comes up selling cookies and Zim, unable to just wait underground until she goes away, like throws the door open and furiously demands to know what she's doing there. <laughs> and when he, he basically sends her away by, it sounds too weird to even describe, stuffing, the cook, stuffing her cookies in a girl's mouth and launching them over the horizon like a cannon. <laughs> and slams the door in her face, expecting her to go away. She doesn't, and instead starts pounding on the door because she wants to get paid for the cookies he wasted. He freaks out, thinking that the enemy is attacking, tells Gurr to get rid of her, <laughs> and one of my favorite exchanges from the comic, full of favorite exchanges, Gurr asks why she's angry, she tells him why, and Gurr joins her in pounding on the door and demanding the money, <laughs> causing Zim to assume that the Girl Scout has some kind of uh, mind controlling powers. Finally, Zim can take it no more and sends the cheese chip back to the massive. Now, the reason that this is a bad thing is because, as Scrang explained on like page two of this comic, the teleporter is only safe one way. So the massive can send things to Zim, but if an invader sends something back, it could potentially blow up half of space. Yes, half the universe, gone. <laughs> So Zim calls them saying he's a, that he's going to send the chip back, but the Tullus are busy playing ping pong. Yes, ping pong. So they send it right to voicemail and they hear Zim announcing he's going to send it back, but it's too late to stop it because it's on voicemail. Which leads to the first time in the entire history of the franchise that the Tullus have ever paid for something they did to Zim. Where t Red furiously yells at the technicians to call Zim back, but it's too late. <laughs> the cheesy munchatronic scrangle on whatever it is is teleported back to the bridge and half its face explodes and i love this final panel of zam buried in his box i have done well i have done so well <laughs> it's such it's such a great moment because it's the perfect display of like zim's delusional nature versus his absolute loyalty it also ends on a pretty funny note where zim where, sorry, Dib and Gaz, who have not really done any, like Dib appeared in one panel early on, but has not really been a part of the plot at all. And the membrane kids basically see on the news that half of space has exploded. Gaz's reaction is very underplayed, whereas Dib, I'll show it to you. Dib has like the most horrified <laughs> look on his face. <laughs> Someone help this poor boy. The ending of this comic is also the reason why I'm pretty sure the tallest survive being thrown into the Florpus um, at the end of Enter the Florpus because it's like Zim blew up the half of space that they were in and they were like I remember reading these comics and wondering for a while like so are they dead <laughs> because there was a like several issues where they didn't appear before they appeared again but no they're fine unfortunately so this issue 
is great. <laughs> I mean, the plot is great. It's got a lot. Of, I didn't even tell you like even a quarter of the really funny jokes that are in this issue. Some of the issues are like not that funny, even though they're supposedly focusing more on comedy than overarching story. This one is funny. It has the exact humor that people like from uh, Invader Zam. And what I like about it is that a lot of the jokes are character based. There are some jokes um, that will work no matter who says them. Uh, for example, uh, there's a joke in The Simpsons where Homer describes alcohol as the cause of and solution to all Luck's problems. That's a joke that's divorced from the character. Like, that joke is funny regardless of who says it. But these particular jokes have a lot to do with who Zim is as a character, from his overreactions to invisible threats to his extreme loyalty. And the just the tallest, just sniveling sadism at making him do things. Or even the fact that Gur joins the girl and banging on the door for the money. Those are all like jokes that are tied into our understanding of the character. And I feel that makes them work better because they're tied. It just makes us love the joke more if it's tied into a character that we also love um, in a way that says something unique about their identity. Like, it sounds cheesy to be like, oh, that Zim, but this is an oh, that Zim comic. And that it's all about him and his psychosis. Uh, the reason I feel like this issue in particular is especially relevant to Enter the Florpus is that Enter the Florpus made pretty clear that Zim's devotion to Tallis isn't just self-serving, it's genuine. He really, really does want them to praise him. And he goes through all of this nonsense just because they told him that it'll help them. It's not like... It's not like the Starscream-esque, like, insincere kowtowing. Like, no, his loyalty is genuine. And... For all his huge overblown ego, he has a lot of patience when it comes to putting up with the tallest shit. Like, this is something that we saw on the show, too, with uh, the Planet Jackers episode, where he let the uh, Fargo guys beat the shit out of him because, um, well, he needed to distract them so that he could keep his mission. And this, I think, is the most interesting dichotomy about Zim. He's an egomaniac. But he's also completely loyal to a regime much bigger than him and slavishly devoted to the leaders of said regime. Now, I don't know how intentional this was, but there might be an interesting sort of psychological point to make here. Um, in my first year at my film school, I had a professor who was not only a screenwriter, but also a practicing psychologist. And of the many off-topic rants that he gave to us during our screenwriting class, whether it be about um, his history of growing, his own past life growing up Jewish, or his uh, shit-ass parents, or um, the war veteran that he used to hate but then made friends. I don't know, he was a rant guy. But anyway, one thing that he said was that a lot of people try to, who are super devoted to a cause, be it a political cause or a religious sect or a cult, or people who are disadvantaged in society somehow. So I kind of hate to bring it out of invaders and territory into more serious world war topics, but it's kind of the same reason that um, poor white people end up a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times being either super racist or super nationalistic. They're basically trying to make up for deficiencies in their own ego by latching onto a higher cause. So a lot of people who are involved in cults or um, are really, really devoted to a political movement are those who are disenfranchised in some way but are using this higher thing as a substitution for their own ego. I don't know how many words, like different ways I can say the same thing, which once may not make relate to Zim's character until you remember that Zim is really short. And this is a society that hates short people. <laughs> and then it makes sense. Zim's extreme devotion to the Urkin Empire could be a coping mechanism to deal with the fact that he himself is very short and thus is someone that all his society looks down on. So if he completely throws himself behind this cause, it can basically be a way to make him feel big, which is a way to reconcile his uh, base, his narcissism with his extreme loyalty. S two things that seem like they wouldn't coexist, but do in a way that actually makes sense from a real world psychological perspective. 
I have no idea if that was intentional. <laughs> Maybe not. But even if it wasn't, it still makes sense because it's a real world phenomenon and you probably don't need to know about psychology to pick up on it, at least subconsciously. So I do feel like that there's this way that Zim's, these two dueling traits of Zim's can actually be understood as one whole. I need to think I'm great. So I make up for my own flaws and my own insecurities by devoting myself to this other thing. And if you do notice in the comics, Zim is portrayed as more self-conscious about his height than he is in the show. Zim's height is only ever brought up once in the first episode, where the tallest describes Zim as a tiny thing. And Zim doesn't seem to really mind. He just charges ahead. But there are several moments in the issues of this comics where characters point out how short Zim is, and he seems to get annoyed at them. Like, he's aware that he has a flaw. Something that didn't seem possible for Zim in the show, because he was so up in the... This, like, haze of his own supposed superiority. And I, for one, like the more self-conscious Zim. Not one who's so self-conscious that he actually grows or is able to grow out of his psychosis, because I feel like part of the comedy and tragedy of the character is that he can't. But one who is... It is acknowledged that he is trying to cover up for his own failings and isn't always succeeding. It's just... I feel like that makes him a more complex and intriguing character, even if he does end up ultimately learning nothing because he's Zim and he never learns anything. So that was issue four. I loved it a lot. Um, the next issue, issue five, if I remember correctly, focuses much more on Dib. This was kind of a Dib-free issue, but uh, that's okay because Zim's my favorite character and Dib got to be the main character in the movie. So like, whatever. So uh, I hope you enjoy this review. There will be more to come. This is Dragon Keeper 96600 signing off.